Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I think we're going to get started. We will have a few more guests uh, streaming in throughout the session, but I think in the interest of time, we'll get started. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name's Yi Chen. I head business development and partnerships at Endow Us, and I'll be moderating the session with these three lovely people tonight. We'll get right into it. Um, just a quick introduction about how ERA and Ritbrick have actually worked together, uh, and, and Ritbrick have worked together in the past along with um, ERA. So ERA and, and Dallas actually signed an MOU about a year ago now, uh, where we you know, spoke together to see how we could work together to really educate the public both on financial literacy, not just from the perspective of investments, but also around real estate. And so we continue to have these different sessions um, to really um, do this for you. In terms of the other sessions we've done also, as you can see in the screen behind me, we've done it both with um, Red Brick. Clive and I have also done a session together, I think yep. about six months ago now. About there. Yeah, and so at the beginning of the year, Marcus Chu, the CEO of ERA, and Greg Van, the CEO of Endowas, has actually done a session on the property markets, as well as the markets in general and how that was going. Um, and you know, this session today is a recap of that and really to close out the year especially things have changed so much in the past year, right? I think if we look at both properties as well as investments and mortgage rates now, I think uh, we've seen quite a sharp increase or decrease depending on, on the individual market. Um, so I think it'll be very interesting today to think about that, talk a bit more about that to see how we can better understand the market. So I'm going to hand over the time now to Senting to introduce Endowas and then after that to the other two speakers to introduce themselves. But maybe um, just a, a quick introduction to Sinting. Alex over there and Clive. Hi everyone, my name is Sin Cheng. Thank you, Yijian, for the introduction and thank you everyone for spending your evening with us. So I'm the Chief Plan Officer and one of the partners at Endow Us. Um, just a very brief um, background with myself, I started my career in, the, in private wealth. So I was at Morgan Stanley in Hong Kong. Then I moved to Singapore about 11 years ago. Um, my last role was at Nomura um, before starting Endow Us in 2017. I mean, we really wanted to make a difference in how the wealth management industry was here because we felt like there were a lot of things that we could do better. So my partners and I decided to start Endow Us. Um, we launched... Sorry, can you make it louder? Oh. Or say, make that mic louder. Please. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So Endow Us is a fee-only wealth advisory platform. Um, and we're actually the only digital platform in Singapore where you can invest both your private wealth, so your cash, as well as your public pension assets, which is your CPF and SRS. And what fee only here means is that we are only paid by our clients and not by any product providers. Um, so we always act in the best interests of our clients. And you can see on the screen um, some of the logos on the left. These are some of our global, um, some of our investors, as well as strategic partners. So UBS, the largest private bank, SoftBank, um, Lightspeed, Samsung, um, Singtel, and EDBI here in Singapore are all investors in Endow Us. And this is our company's mission to help everyone invest better, to live easier today and better tomorrow. Um, and just, you know, at Endow Us, we really, really focus on three pillars, advice, access, and cost. So in terms of advice, you know, we try to provide strategic passive asset location. Um, we pick some of the best fund managers out there to partner with in order to create portfolios that are appropriate for our clients' goals in life. We provide access to institutional share class funds, which traditionally have only been available to the largest investors, and we've made that available for everyone. And our last pillar is cost. And we've tried to lower uh, the cost of investing for uh, on every level as much as we can. That's the lowest hanging fruit in really trying to improve your investment returns. And as I mentioned before, we've partnered with some of the largest fund managers out there. Um, and what we try to do is to leverage their expertise to help our clients invest in some of the best products globally. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and create the investment products ourselves, what we try to do is really stand on the shoulders of giants um, and, and be able to access some of the institutional quality products that we know are out there. And as, as a company and as a platform, you know, we put clients at the center of everything we do. So we're very, very client-centric, and we really try to act in the best interest of our clients. And in fact, you know, all of our employees are also users of our, you know, of our investment portfolios in, in our platform. And these are just some of the reviews that you know, we've gotten from our clients. 
Now I'm going to pass it to Alex. Thank you. Okay, so uh, very good uh, evening, everyone. So uh, welcome to uh, ERA APEC Center. So uh, this is actually a, a building that's uh, purchased uh, by ERA uh, four years back. And I think uh, we are proud to say that we are the only agency that actually owns a building today. And uh, this looks like a cinema setting. Uh, for those who are aware, this was actually a, a previous uh, cinema as well. So I think uh, ERA you know, bought it, you know, retrofit it. You can see that from level one all the way to the level trees, you know, everything is catered you know, for our clients and also for our agents. You know, so I think uh, the uh, ERA brand uh, has always been a high household name uh, in Singapore. Okay, so we are under the uh, APEC Realty uh, and the SGX uh, Stock Exchange. And of course, uh, ERA being ERA, we are a full-fledged uh, real estate uh, service, a brokerage firm. And of course, uh, we have different arms like valuations, you know, management. And I think, uh, needless to say, we have uh, thousands and thousands of clients you know, every single year. Right? So I think uh, moving forward, you know, we hope to have more of a support and I hope you guys can enjoy the session today. Yeah, thank you so much. Pass on the Clive. Thank you. Test, test. 4%, 5%. Can you hear me? I know that's interesting. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Clive. I'm the Associate Director for Red Brick Mortgage Advisory. Um, just a bit of our company. Uh, we started the business in 2014. And till date, we have grown to become the largest mortgage advisory firm in the market. Uh, primarily, what we help our clients with is really to structure their mortgage portfolio, to find the most efficient way to buy your property, right? If you are going on to buy uh, multiple properties, what is the most efficient way to do it? We also broker loans, right, uh, from all banks in Singapore. And we don't charge any fees for our services, and but not only not only in Singapore, but for mortgages overseas as well. All right, um, I think we'll jump right into the session. So we'll have the speaker sharing different uh, topics uh, throughout the evening. Um, but I think the first thing that we really wanted to cover here was really around inflation. You know, inflation is something that we have been hearing about, we've been reading about, and talked a lot about in the news and I guess over the coffee table over uh, the past few months, right? Um, and I think this is a very key example here. So if you take a look at the slide behind me, what you can see essentially is how, you know, the price of Gaiatos has actually gone up in the past year. So literally in the past 12 months, I think you've seen an increase of prices across the board, across different sectors. But I think if you're talking about something that hits a bit closer to home, you know, Kayatov's asset has gone up about 16 to 17% in the past year alone. And so the question around that is, you know, how is that really affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis? How is that affecting us in terms of how we look at money and our relationship with it? And how do we actually set up ourselves up so that we're able to protect ourselves from the downside of inflation? Um, so Sinting will cover a bit about that and then we'll jump into some of the other topics after this. There was a survey done by OCBC recently where they found that, you know, almost 40% of respondents now face difficulties in paying their housing loans because of the rise in interest rates. And, you know, this really hits close to my heart because I am in the process of refinancing my own mortgage now from my housing. Um, and it's gone up from about, and I was just talking with Alex about this right before our session, it's about 1.2% um, two years ago, and now it's close to 4%. So can really feel the difference every month. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, for most of us, right, income has definitely not gone up in the same way as how much our mortgages have gone up by. And so we do really have to make some difficult choices about you know, where that difference is coming from. And for myself, I just had a baby a couple months ago. So adding a child into that equation, you know, there's a lot more, I guess, planning to do now and to stretch every dollar. And it's really, really important, you know, not to overstretch yourself when you decide how much loan you can take and what kind of house you can afford. And generally, it's quite, it's, it's a bit more prudent, you know, if you allocate up to 30 to 40 percent of your income every month on housing-related payments. And I mean, just to show you the math on this, right? So if you have a $500,000 loan at a 1.2 percent um, interest rate over a 30-year loan, your monthly payment is about $1,600. At a 4% interest rate, that's $2,400. It's actually a 50% increase on a month-to-month -month basis. And what exactly is the relationship between you know, inflation and interest rates, right? I mean, generally, they go hand in hand together, right? And central banks have been using interest rates as a way to control inflation. And what inflation really means is just a general rise in the prices of goods and services. 
and it's caused by you know, higher demand, um, you know, a scarcity of goods. And when, and it really hits you know, all of us hard, both consumers and businesses, because higher borrowing costs will cause businesses and consumers to really clamp down on spending. And Singapore's inflation has reached an almost 14 year high. And we're used to a world of low inflation in the last decade or so. But with threats of you know, deglobalization, higher labor costs, as well as you know, GST increases, it's quite likely that we're gonna see um, these levels of inflation um, that's gonna stay around for a while. And with the rise in inflation interest rates, you know, many Singaporeans and, and maybe many of us in this room, it really caught us off guard. And it's caused a lot of people to really be worried about retirement adequacy. And it's made saving for retirement even more difficult. And we really have to make every dollar work harder for us. And staying in cash today means that there's actually a higher cost in doing so because higher inflation means that it's eating into our cash savings. So for example, a 2% increase in inflation over a 30 year period, it erases $30, $34 for every $100 that you've saved for your retirement. So like the example that Yichen gave on Kaya Toast, right? Your $100 today is gonna buy a lot less for you in 30 years. I'm gonna pass it to Alex now to talk a little bit about the Singapore property market. Yeah, so I guess So I think Alex, you know, I think if, if you know, Sinting's been talking about how you know prices have been going up and all that, um, and inflation has been going up. But I think in context of the property market, it also seems to be quite red hot, like ERA red, right? Um, so it's been quite hot. But I think that you know, even though you know things have been getting more expensive, property has been getting more expensive. It hasn't seemed to taper that taper down at all. So I guess we want to get a better sense of your thoughts around how the property market is doing, why it's continuing to go up, and where you see it going um, in the near future. So I think uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> so I think in the past uh, two years, um, you know, many things have happened, and I think uh, inflation itself, uh, again, you know, like what uh, you know, Sinting said, it's really a toll. Takes a toll a lot of on on the money, and I think uh, I think a lot of Singaporeans are getting more and more affluent, you know, and they actually understand this, and that's why sometimes we see how come the property market actually is being propped up. It's also because of true inflation, right? So through inflation, you know, goods and services increase. And I think um, for real estate itself, we do see it as a type of asset that actually hedges against inflation. So from the chart, you can see just over the past uh, live, for the past nine months, there was an increase of 8.2%, right? So um, you know, as much as it goes, uh, you know, I believe a lot of Singaporeans are actually hedging their money uh, through real estate itself. Yeah. Okay. And I think uh, there's also another important part uh, that we're looking at, uh, why are property prices are increasing today? It's also because you know the general economics of uh, demand and supply. Okay, so if you look at the past year itself, uh, this year, okay, there's actually a dwindling supply in the market in terms of uh, transactions, you know, in terms of the new you know products that the uh, GLS and government actually put up for sale. You know, that's why you can see a reduction in transactions. You can see that over the last year, 2021, there's actually transactions adding up to around 12,000 units. But for this uh, last three quarters, you know, adding up at 6,000, so we anticipate the whole year to be around 8,000. That's actually a reduction of a good uh, 30 to 40 percent in terms of uh, transactions. It's also because there's lesser uh, supply you know, in the market itself. You know? So this is some of the reasons you know, why the actual market is being propped up in terms of uh, the price itself. Yep. And because of the uh, low supply, you can see that, um, you know, People are actually rushing to show flats you know, and things like that. I think it's a very common scene today. It's all because of the uh, dwindling supply. And I think even next year itself, uh, we do see that it probably act uh, very much in the same way unless the, the government you know, re releases more supply. Right? If not, it's going to be probably in terms of uh, uh, supply is pretty much going to be the same direction as well. Okay. And also because of that, um, prices go up. Right? You can see that today, renters have... Uh, spiral because uh, prices increase you know and the uh, buyers sometimes they take a different approach they may think hey you know why not i rent a place right so that kind of demand has uh, been into the uh, secondary market and also when the economy starts to open up uh, there's more demand coming in as well so 
expats are coming in, you know, offices and businesses are reopening, you know, bringing in uh, these uh, expats. So you can see, based on statistics, it's a 20% increase this year. But I think uh, it's uh, much more than that for certain properties. You have so I have, uh, you know, friends uh, in the HDB, I think uh, they probably doubled yeah, in just uh, a year itself. Right? Like from uh, 1,007 to uh, 3,004. I think these are things that is uh, happening, um, really happening in the market. So this is, uh, uh, renters are really going up quite a fair bit because of this. Yeah. So in terms of the uh, sentiment that's on the ground, okay, again, because of the rise in prices, especially in the private property segment, okay, and also properties around, even for the resale, um, actually prompt a lot of buyers to look back into uh, the BTO HDB flats. Right? So I have actually friends that uh, missed the BTO like 11 times, and they're still not giving up. Are you guys, uh, are you all trying for BTOs? <laughs> I have no idea why, but they're still trying, right? Because uh, that's uh, considered a little bit of a... Uh, affordable housing for ma majority of Singaporeans. So you can see from the chart itself, uh, it's actually oversubscribed. This is actually the, the uh, rates oversubscribed, which means uh, if you look at Jurong West, if, if there's 100 units, it's seven times oversubscribed. Yeah, so this is how, how it looks like. Right? It's really oversubscribed. Right? So again, this pushes demand back into the resale market. So you can see this is why the prices of the resale have been going up as well. Okay, and because of that, you know, they're also uh, searching into the resale and also the EC markets. Right? So today, uh, you can have ECs at Tenet. We have uh, actually launched uh, Tenet EC at Tempenis. Okay, in the next week, uh, we'll probably be rounding up the applications. Um, the two weeks ago, sorry, last month, we had a launch at Copper Grand, which is at the Tengah. So again, it was sold uh, 71%. So uh, it's pretty strong demand for the EC market itself. Okay, so this is the slide to show you. I think uh, Common Grand, uh, if you all explored Tengah itself, it's a new green town by the government. Uh, everything is new. Uh, we even have a uh, transportation so or underneath. So I think it's going to be a whole new township by itself, similar to something like, like the past Pongo. Yeah, so this is what is happening. Okay, uh, EC visitors have uh, drawn quite a fair bit of uh, demand and uh, over the past uh, two weekends. Yep. Okay, so uh, what we think is that uh, moving forward, because of all these factors, we do see that uh, there's going to be a tight labour market. I think today uh, employment is still relatively healthy. Okay, uh, a lot of wealthy individuals, you know, I was, you know, we we're mentioning, you know, what if, uh, you know, one, one day China were to open up, maybe, you know, yeah. you guys can share a bit more. Huh? Yeah. And of course, there's an increase of demand, you know, in terms of uh, goods and services and jobs. And that's why, you know, Singapore is very small. I think uh, we are absorbing these uh, effects from, uh, you know, our macro economy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, wealthy foreigners, again, they are finding safety in uh, Singapore um, for whatsoever reasons. Okay, I think uh, Singapore today, uh, we have good uh, business structure, good infrastructure. They're coming in for healthcare, for education. So this is actually attracting a lot of uh, the wealthy uh, coming up to Singapore, especially, you know, setting up things like family offices. Yeah. Uh, this has been uh, accelerated over the past two years. Uh, more than double uh, in terms of uh, family offices uh, in Singapore, uh, with um, average uh, assets of more than uh, 30 million per family office. You know, this is what has been created. Now we have like more than 700 family offices uh, in Singapore alone. Yeah. So I guess like property prices, they still have been going up. And so I think we know about the recent cooling measures that the government has you know, activated or applied to the market. But how are we seeing the impact of those cooling measures and do you think it will work? Um, do you think there'll be more cooling measures that might come out in the future? I think people would be interested to just understand a bit more about how that actually affects them also um, in terms of how they're doing their property purchases. Yeah. I think uh, we can't uh, speculate, but the thing is, uh, I think the government has their own set of uh, you know, rules, right? So if it exceeds certain indicators, you know, there will be more measures. And of course, probably if it doesn't hit, then we won't see any measures, right? So I think uh, the recent cooling measures, uh, maybe I'll just do a very quick update. It's actually happened on the 30th of September, which is a uh, very recent. Okay, I think uh, it's more targeted towards the uh, HDB markets because uh, there are lots of uh, million dollar HDBs up and coming. I think this is one of the triggers uh, for the uh, uh, cooling measures. You know, So on the, my extreme left, um, you can see they actually also increased the uh, what we call the uh, interest floor rates in terms of calculations. 
you know, from uh, 3.5 to 4 percent, you know, which means you know, get lesser loan. Maybe later on, you, know, you guys can expand a little bit. And uh, today, uh, even the MSR on my extreme on your right, okay, this is actually for the HDB calculations. Uh, previously, they were using like 2.6 percent interest to analyze your affordability, but today they have increased it to 3 percent, which actually reduces uh, affordability again, uh, not just for the private but also for the uh, HDB, you know, public sector. You can see there's also a change. Uh, I think this is a very, very big change uh, in terms of the loan to value limits for HDB. Uh, in the past, um, Singaporeans can actually buy a HDB with just a 10% down payment, okay, using a HDB loan. But today, they have changed it from 10% down payment, they changed it to 15% down payment, and the most recent, they changed it to 20% down payment. Uh, I think at the end of the day, just, they want to reduce the demand you know, for public housing. Yeah, so this is one of the major changes. Okay, I think last but not least, uh, very uh, interesting, uh, because this is a very new cooling measure to us. Because for us, we only understand, you know, ABSDs, you know, taxation, you know, uh, things like that. But this was a special uh, cooling measure that actually states that uh, for private property owners that made money over the past two to three years, um, they're not allowed to buy back a HDB. Yep. Okay, if they're below uh, 55, yep. they have to wait out a 15 month. So actually, this actually uh, reduces uh, the cash-rich, you know, asset-rich uh, consumers to actually prop up the HDB market. So I think these cooling measures are targeted there. But on the caveat, uh, those who are above 55, they can still buy back a HDB, but it has to be a four-bedroom and below. Yep. So this is what uh, the measures are. Yeah. So a lot of uh, Singaporeans are shocked and surprised, um, none to say, because uh, even they make money from their private property, they want to retire, right? They want to buy back an HDB, but they are caught in this jam. Yeah. But I think ultimately, uh, the government has said that this is a temporary measure. So uh, we are also unsure whether they would unwind, but this is the status of it today. Yep. All right. No, thanks so much for that, Alex. I think we'll pass it over to Clive. So Clive, I think when you're... Oh, okay. Clive, I think as we're looking at the markets right now, um, as much as we see property prices going up, we also see something else going up. It's <laughs> called uh, interest rates, and it's yes. also called, as Sinting talked about, I think mortgage rates, right? Yes. So that's been going up quite significantly in a very, very short period of time. Yes. So I think we would love to understand a bit more about a couple of different things. One, you know, how I think the government's cooling measures are actually impacting this, but also secondly, you know, how people can really, you know, get the right rates um, yeah. and be able to still afford their housing on a monthly sure. basis. Sure. Okay. Testing. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. I think many great points uh, shared by Sing Ting and uh, Alex themselves, and I think I can't wait to go into the Q&A discussion later on. Uh, yeah, but just on the interest rate front, um, to reiterate, okay, um, whenever you want to borrow or you want to take on a mortgage in Singapore, be it for a private property or for HDB, you would have to, you would have to conform to this thing called the total debt servicing ratio or the mortgage servicing ratio to determine how much the banks would actually lend you. Now, traditionally, the banks would always stress test your income against an interest rate. Usually, it's 3.5%. Why back then interest rates were pretty low? You were looking at one-ish, maybe two, two-ish percent. So 3.5% seems like a good buffer. But this has since changed, like Alex mentioned, recently on the 30th of September, to become 4%. Now, on top of this, what is maybe not known to some of you guys is that interest rates have gone beyond that 4% mark recently. If you look into the mortgage market today, you're probably going to look at something from 4% to maybe 4.5%. Obviously, the stresses cannot remain at 4%, right? Otherwise, it's no longer called a stress test. So the banks have internally, even before MES moved up the stress test to 4%, the banks internally have already, some banks, have already moved up their own internal stress test to beyond 4%, right? And this is what we are seeing in the market today. So if you are looking to purchase a property and you go to a bank uh, to take on a mortgage loan, hey, guess what? Your stress test would probably be at 4.5% already. So this further reduces the amount of loan you'll be able to, uh, be able to get. Okay, so from 4 to 4.5. And we'll, uh, I'll just show you a simple illustration of um, how this impacts uh, the mortgage that you're going to get. Now, last time, which is not too long ago, interest rates stress test was at 3.5%, raised to 4%. If you took on a 30-year loan mortgage, 
stress tested at 3.5%, you could have borrowed $1 million. With this new stress test to 4%, that eligibility falls down to 940. Not that significant, not that significant, but with this interest rate stress test going up again by 50 basis points to 4.5%, from $940,000 that you will be, uh, you know, initially could have borrowed, this would have gone down to $886,000. From a million dollars to $886,000. Now, of course, you and I would feel the impact. But then the question beckons, right? Wow, why did the property prices not go down, right? Then we look at it again. The, not everybody, for, for example, you and I, if we can borrow up to a million dollars, not everyone would borrow up to a million dollars. Not everybody would hit the limit of that 55% total debt servicing ratio. Traditionally, it doesn't happen that way. The total debt servicing ratio hovers between a range of like 40 to maybe 50%, somewhere there. So even if total debt servicing ratio falls from the uh, original 60% down to 55%, which is where it is today, it hasn't really impacted the property market that much. Of course, a small group of buyers who are looking to really you know, squeeze every dollar from the bank, yeah, these are the guys who would be impacted at this point of time. So just to translate this into loan re eligibility reduction, this is really a reduction of 11% in terms of your borrowing ability. Um, the government is smart, I think. Right? Instead of reducing total debt servicing ratio again from 55% to 50%, they increase the stress test because the effect is going to be similar. Right? And if we just want to talk about, you know, let's, let's talk about total debt servicing ratio if we leave stress tests at 3.5%, for example, your effective total debt servicing ratio will be at 49%. So how does this make sense uh, to you and I? If you're drawing an income of $10,000, if you're purchasing a property, a private property, you could have used up to $5,500 initially of your income to service the mortgage. Today, you would only be able to use up to $4,900 to service the mortgage. So this definitely has an impact uh, moving forward for certain groups of people who are looking to purchase properties and really leverage right to their maximum loan eligibility that they qualify for. But I say again, it doesn't hit everybody in the market because generally, you and I, we won't push it to the maximum, right? And it's also a good rule of thumb to not you know, uh, push it to the maximum. Now, the question that everybody wants to know is, Clive, with interest rates so high in the market, should I go for fixed interest rates or should I go for variable interest rates at this point of time? Well, <laughs> if you have been following the markets, uh, the curve is like what you see on the graph, right? What is shown here actually is um, Cybor rates and Sora rates. So just to give you a quick introduction of Cybor and Sora, Cybor used to be the primary benchmark uh, lending mortgage rate in Singapore, right? Uh, only recently did MAS mention that this Cybor rate will be phased out. So the deadline for Cybor being phased out is going to be 2024. Majority of you who have had a mortgage and if you're coming out of your lock-in period would be packed to Cybor today. You will receive a letter telling you that interest rates are close to 4% plus whatever spread that you're on. Most likely you're going to pay 45 or maybe close to 5% already. Today in the market, the bank's uh, MAS has launched a new rate which is Sora, the Singapore Overnight Rate Average. Um, its movement is rather similar to Cybor. However, the difference is that Sora is actually based on actual transactions right, for interbank borrowing, whereas Cybor was based on estimates or quotations, for example. Okay? So as you can see, the trend is clear. Moving forward, we are going to expect another round of uh, rate hikes uh, this coming December and probably another time in February next year. Um, as of now, uh, what is uh, forecasted, uh, you hear in the news, is that the Feds are probably going to raise rates to the current 4% 4, 4 to maybe 5% moving forward. So the local market in Singapore is not going to be spared as well. So if you are sitting on the fence and you're still thinking, oh Clive, should I refinance my mortgage now? Should I just wait? Because many people say that a recession is going to come in the next few months. I don't know. This has been going around in the market. Uh, you probably just want to move into hedge at this point of time, maybe with a fixed interest rate, right? So that is, uh, that's probably a question. But there are also a lot of other considerations. Some people view this as an opportunity, right? And I want to go into a variable interest rate. But Clive, if variable interest rates climb to 5%, oh, I'll be losing out. And then some people say, Clive, I go into a fixed interest rate at 4.25%. What if the market drops next year? I'm in a two-year fixed interest rate. And I'll be paying 425 when someone else is paying half, you know, the amount of mortgage I'm paying. This is the crystal ball question that no one can predict. But there are certain ways that you can leverage. Um, there are certain things that you can leverage on in the market itself 
uh, or features from the banks that allow you to basically bring down your effective interest rate, right? Using some deposits that you have, for example, right? That can further bring down your effective interest rate while being on a floating or variable interest rate, right? So if the market really turns and interest rates start coming down, being packed to Sora is good because you ride the wave down, right? So, and, and you have that cash that helps you at the same time. So this is the news that I've been talking about, right? Interest rates perhaps going to 5%. But then there is also another school of uh, there is also another party saying that you know what, Clive, the market is definitely going to crash in 2023. I don't know this is a crystal ball question, but you have famed investors like Drunken Miller saying that it's bound to happen in 2023. Will it happen? When will it happen? We really don't know. But there are certain things that we can see in the market as well. I mean, uh, and just now we were discussing in, like in the equities market when is a good time to go into the market. No one dares the time. It's always time in the market, even for real estate, rather than timing the market, right? But we know that the markets have been down. We don't need to buy at the absolute bottom of the market. I don't think many people can time that. But as long as you're going in cheap, I think it's still all right, right? <laughs> so if that happens in the market, then in 2023, it's going to, I mean, or, or maybe at the tail end or moving into 2024, if interest rates, I mean, if, if there is really a recession that hits the market, depending on its severity, we might see interest rates come down. This year alone, I think it still has been pretty all right. Interest rates have been going up because the economy has been quite, quite good. Uh, the labor market in Singapore and also in the US has been quite tight, right? We've seen unemployment still sitting at a three and a half, maybe 3.6% uh, 3 levels uh, uh, around there and it's not uh, going up anytime soon. Uh, and I think during the pandemic, many people have accumulated savings and cash because you don't spend, you don't travel, uh, maybe the most of you will, will start cycling. They have a lot of cyclists on the roads, then all the road users become more angry because of the cyclists <laughs> on the roads. I'm not too sure whether if you're one of them. But yeah, the economy currently is still holding up pretty well. But moving to next year, we know that there are certain signs that the US Feds look out for, which is unemployment. And of course, another thing that, just, that is quite important that they look at is probably going to be wage growth. Wage growth in the US is still right, right, quite nice. Um, in order for the Fed to start pivoting, they probably have to see wage growth come down to a certain level. Um, but I, I think the, the, I mean, you and I know that the indicators that the US Feds use are lagging indicators, right? You look at unemployment, past data, you look at inflation, which is past data. And because of that, I think there is a tendency, I mean, historically as well, for the Feds to overshoot, right? To raise and overshoot. And that usually may lead into a recessionary environment. So if that's going to be the case, if there's going to be a recessionary environment, then good for you and I who own mortgages. But I mean, of course, not so good because the economy will also, will also come down and there are going to be un, um, undesired effects uh, from, from that as well. But yeah, no one can predict what's going to happen. I think in the short time, uh, in the short term, uh, review, speak to your advisors about it, review your mortgages. There are a lot of features out there that can help you hedge. Uh, it's not as simple as just going for a fix of loading interest rate. So do talk to your advisors to find out more. Thanks. Thanks very much, Clive. I think it's very insightful. But I think, you know, when you, when you look at it, it's quite a crazy market right now and it's hectic and it's a roller coaster ride um, across all markets. So I think one of the questions that people are always trying to figure out or really understand is how they should really fund this, right? Because at the end of the day, if interest rates are going to go up, your mortgage rates are going to go up, you're, you can't spend as much, you know, really to purchase those properties. So in Singapore, there are two ways to really fund it, right? You either fund it with cash or you fund it with CPF, right? And that is something that people always are trying to figure out because with CPF, you also eventually have to, you know, pay that back to yourself, to your CPF account. So I think Sinting would love to hear your thoughts just a bit more about how people should consider looking at, you know, their monies and how they utilize cash or CPF uh, to finance their housing. Thanks, Yi Chen. So I was just, you know, listening to Clive just now and I, I wish that I, I actually spoke to him before I refinance my mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you know, do we use cash or CPF to fund a property purchase? It's a question that, you know, most Singaporeans here have. And, I mean, we use, and it's a question that we at Endow Us get very, very often too, because as you know, you know, we offer portfolios to invest people CPF. And before they invest a CPF, you know, one of the considerations is, should I invest this money or should I use it to purchase my property? So you're thinking about CPF, um, obviously if you use that, then it frees up the cash that you have on hand. And cash is something that you can use. There's a lot more uses for it. You can use it for your daily expenses. You can use it for your rainy day fund. For you know, if something comes up, you can use your cash, but you can't immediately use your CPF for that. And if you use your both your cash and CPF, 
then you can also possibly um, buy a larger property, take on a larger loan. But the, on, on the flip side, right, um, I mean, CPF is really meant for your retirement savings. So using it for your housing means that you know you might not have enough money at 55. You might not have money enough money when you retire. And also, using your CPF to buy housing isn't free. You do have to return what you borrow into your CPF account plus accrued interest. In terms of you know using cash, um, the pros for that is that um, you're saving up for your retirement, which is what your CPF is meant to do. There's no need to return money or the accrued interest to your CPF when you sell your property. But then you also have, um, you know, if something comes up and, and things happen in life, you have a medical emergency, something happens to your family, you may or may not be able to use your CPF for that. And so you have a much kind of lower um, barrier to safety. And you know, I thought this was really interesting. We saw it in a CPF report. So in 2020, um, there was 13% of people who sold their properties, refunded uh, their money back to CPF, and actually couldn't fully repay the amount back of the, the, the sell amount plus the accrued interest. So it's kind of, you know, it's really a cautionary tale Right, you have to really think carefully about what is the amount of loan, what is the size of the property that you can purchase. And I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think there's really a kind of one size fits all answer to this, whether you should use your CPF or your cash for your property purchase. And interesting enough, when, when I bought my property, um, my lawyer was actually trying to convince me to use more of my CPF, which I thought was a little bit strange. So I asked him, okay, I mean, why, why, why are you advising me to use my CPF? And he told me, you know, everyone does it. <laughs> and, and, and for me, I, I mean, I didn't think that was a good enough reason <laughs> to use my CPF. Um, but I guess it just shows you also, you know, the mentality of people who choose to wipe out their CPF for the housing, which is not necessarily a right or wrong thing, but you should be taking you know, your circumstances into account for making that decision. And, and it's not a kind of binary decision. And for me, I ended up using both cash and CPF to fund my property purchase after kind of looking through you know, what are my assets, what are my liabilities, what are some of my cash flow needs over the next 10, 20 years. Okay. And, you know, property is probably one of the biggest money decisions that, you know, all of us have to make, right? But, you know, I think it's also important that you think about your wealth in a more holistic manner and not think about property in a very kind of siloed way. Like, how does it fit into my overall wealth picture? And you know, at, at Endow Us, we really focus on the idea of goals-based investing, right? For us, um, what investment success looks like is helping clients reach their financial and life goals, whether that is buying a property, saving for, their, for your kids' education, planning for your retirement, rather than really trying to beat the market. Because at the end of the day, you know, what's important to you, right? It's really reaching these goals and not whether you beat the S&P 500 index in any given year. And so, and, and coming up with these goals really helps you focus on, you know, what you should be investing in. What's your time horizon? What is the kind of risk that you should be taking for this? And how to build the appropriate portfolio to reach these goals. And I mean, thinking, taking all this into consideration is important when also deciding, you know, how does my property purchase fit into this bigger picture? <coughs> Um, and I wanted to share that, you know, at Endowas as well, one of the ways that we help clients think through this is to come up with a wealth implementation plan. You know, so we ask clients to think about, okay, what are your short, shorter term goals? Like, what are some of the things that you want to achieve in the next 10 years? Is it a down payment, um, your mortgage, a car, um, your kids, or in investing into your own company? What are your longer term goals that are a little bit further out, like over 10 years from now? Um, and you know, at what age are you planning to retire? 
what kind of lifestyle do you want to live um, when in retirement? And what does that mean in spending in today's dollars? And just maybe, um, and this is like, this is how we sort of map out how um, your uh, needs and liabilities are over time and what your cash flow requirements are, right? So you have like pretty steady cash, cash flow needs for things like your education, um, your rent, maybe your, your loan repayment. You have these lumpy um, liabilities for things like your asset purchases, um, planning for your wedding, your down payment. And there are these continuous needs that you have every day, like setting up your rainy day fund, thinking about your annual insurance needs, and just accumulating your wealth over time. I mean, there's a, there's, it, it can be, I think, a little bit overwhelming when thinking about financial planning, um, but that's what a financial advisor is here to help you with, whether it's a digital platform like ourselves or a lot of other financial advisors out there. All right, so um, I think we're just getting to the end of the session. We have Q&A right after this. Um, right now, what I'm just going to show you are actually three different QR codes. The first is Endowers, the second one is ERA, and the third one is Red Brick. Um, so for each one of them, you've either got the opportunity to speak to an advisor or to get a really special promotion. So I'll just share the Endowers one first really quickly. You know, as Sinting has shared, Endowers is Singapore's leading digital wealth advisor. We currently have more than $2 billion under assets, and we allow people to invest their cash, CPF, and SRS all online on one platform. So actually, if you just scan this QR code, there's no obligation to obviously invest in all that, but you can create your account today, and what you'll get here is $50 off your fees. Um, secondly, if you do just create an account, which is literally your username and password, you can also get one of our tote bags or umbrellas. And then lastly, if you do go through the account creation, again, no obligation to invest today, uh, then you can also get a Starbucks gift card. Also, I do have colleagues here tonight, so I've got Nick at the back, uh, who will also be managing the mic later, as well as Nicolette and Shingshi outside who can answer any of your questions. But again, this code is only for tonight. Um, it expires at 23.59, um, meaning like 11.59 p.m. So if you want to scan and learn a bit more, that's great. Um, we'll flash this up again later. Um, the second is if you do want to get in touch with ERA to really understand more about your property needs or you want to talk to one of their agents to really understand how um, you should look at your property purchases or your rentals, please feel free to scan this code also. I'm sure Alex and his team will be more than happy to help you answer your questions um, and also help you with your next property purchase or rental or sale. Um, I'll make sure I send my mom over to you. <laughs> and then lastly, um, you know, I think with what Clive has been talking a lot about around you know, mortgage rates, interest rates, I'm sure this is something that is quite concerning to a lot of people. And as you said, there's no crystal ball, so we have no idea where it's going. But I think at the end of the day, I think Red Brick is here to make sure that you have you know, a, a red brick or a red roof or whatever you want to have over your house. Um, and so please scan this QR code so that you can also get in touch with a red brick consultant. Um, I believe you also have four or five of your colleagues that are at the back and they'll also be downstairs later to answer some questions. Um, just so you know, we have pre prepared a buffet spread for you downstairs after this session. So, you know, all the advisors from all the different uh, companies will be down there to answer your questions. Um, while you are enjoying the food and drink at the same time also. So for you lucky people who turned up, I think we actually had planned for more food for more people. So feel free to eat uh, two or three times the, the, the food that, that, that you would like to eat. All right. So I think we'll jump right into Q&A. Uh, my colleague Nick has the mic. Um, if you do have a question, just feel free to raise your hand and he'll run down to you and pass the mic so that you can ask your questions to any one of these lovely speakers tonight. Thank you. Yeah, and then I'll start asking questions after that also, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yours should go back on again. Oh, I see. I think it will be faster now. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, of course, now because interest rates have been going up, um, if you've recently purchased, a, I mean, if you purchased a property previously and you're looking to refinance the property now, one of the things that you can do to manage your cash flow better is also, of course, to extend the loan tenure. Right, um, you always have the opportunity to do so when you're refinancing. Right, so whenever you purchase a property, your loan tenure uh, generally is, is shorter. Right, you borrow up to the age of 65. But when you refinance your, your mortgage, then you can stretch your loan tenure up to the age of 75 years. So that, of course, would give you a better cash flow immediately. Of course, now because interest rates are rising, that is one way to manage your cash flow better 
uh, you know, if your financial situation hasn't changed. So yeah, I think that's something to consider. Of course, in the longer run, you might be paying a little, uh, a little bit more interest, but then whenever you do a refinancing again, one, two years later, you have the ability to move that loan tenor again to wherever you want it to be. Yeah. So I guess maybe a couple of questions just, just for the both of you also for Alex as well as for Sinting. I think Alex, as you're looking at the property market, and I know you had spoken a bit about it later, but as you see, you know, um, I guess supply that is still constricted. I mean, what what are some ways or um, that that people can actually look for? You know, maybe gems in the market where they're still. And maybe you can't answer this question, but I'm just curious. Also, I mean, th there are different um, areas that people are prefer. There are obviously different types of properties that they they like. But I think what are some of the tips or maybe some of the suggestions that you give to your own clients um, as you are reviewing their property needs and their property decisions with them. Okay, thanks for the question. So I think uh, in terms of property, there's uh, different segments of uh, buyers and investors. But I think as of today, uh, we do see a big group, approximately 80 to 85% of the buyers, they're actually looking more towards the own stay segment, right? Buying something for their own stay. So I think uh, the investors are probably uh, are those, uh, they are buying their, maybe their second property, it stands a smaller percentage. So actually for those who really want to buy something that you know, is probably going to ride out the wave, you know, hedge against inflation, we'll suggest them to actually buy something more towards the uh, areas of own stay, right? So somewhere whereby you know there's going to be the next upgraded demand, you know, the own stay demand. I think those are pretty safe in terms of uh, asset as well as an investment. You know, for those who want to buy the two-in-one uh, investment in a, a home, so I think it's always good to buy something that you know that you know, it's going to be uh, demand, which is in demand you know, in the next uh, maybe three to five years' time. So these are areas that you can look at. And I think Sinting, oh, sorry, there, okay. I'll ask one really quick question and then Mike, you can, you can just pass him the mic any, Nick can pass him the mic anyways. Um, no, so Sinting, I think when you're looking at, um, you know, when people are selling their properties, I think as we were mentioning a lot, there are people who are older now who are selling and downgrading their property so that they have, you know, perhaps enough cash to live on. So I guess when people are downgrading and they're living in a small place and they have this chunk of change, uh, my first question is how, how, how would you maybe suggest people make investments to be able to utilize and stretch out that cash more. And then I think secondly, as you're looking at rates going up, how can people make investments in a certain way that can actually keep up with inflation and keep up with rates? No, I mean, that that's a great question. Thanks, Yichen. I think the first thing to look at is, you know, what's really your goal, right? Um, you know, are you planning to spend all your money? Are you planning to pass some of it down to your to your children? Um, do you need money for medical expenses, right? And if you know that you need the money and, and in a very short period of time, say, you know, one, two years, then you should really look at something very um, more conservative, like money market funds, very short duration fixed income funds. Um, that if you're actually, I mean, if you're a little bit older, but actually what you're planning to do is to pass that money down to your children, then your investment horizon is actually much, much longer, right? Um, you're you know, your kids could be still very young age, maybe they're like 20 under, then you have a much longer investment horizon and you can actually afford to take more risk. You can perhaps invest in a higher percentage of equities in your portfolio, for example, because you know that you'll be able to sit through different market cycles. Hi, um, thanks for that, uh, guys, all, all very interesting. My, my name is Jen. Um, uh, a couple of questions, if I may, uh, maybe for, for, for Clive, first off, um, I actually work for a bank in Singapore, and we're very interested at in the number of people who are picking three-month Sora rate products as opposed to one-month Sora rate products. You drew a really good graph earlier on there. I think it was a green and a red line showing the upward trend of one-month Sora and, uh, and three-month. Now, three-month is a longer lag. So banks are charging 35, 40 basis points more on three-month Sora. So the headline rate that you're going to get as a client, as a customer of a bank, tends to be about the same today, whether you're buying a one-month or indexed mortgage or a three-month. That won't pertain in six months or 12 months' time. So we look at each other somewhat confused at some of the other banks in, in, in Singapore, and we wonder whether there's going to be questions of mis-selling by banks, uh, selling three-month or type products, because that one-month or will not stay consistently above the three months or 
over an economic cycle. And yet for the pr privilege of buying a three months or a product, you're paying an extra 35, 40 basis points. Is that a concern you guys have when you're, when you're advising people on mortgages? We, that is actually a really uh, easy answer to that. We don't have a choice <laughs> because the bank's always been, right? And you're working for a bank, so you know. The majority of the banks do not offer a one month SORA option. This is the easy answer because the banks only offer a three month SORA option. You may have some They're banks- They're digging a big hole for themselves. Then. Yeah. So, so we are limited in, in terms of options. You may have certain, may, maybe you would have one or maybe two banks that are offering both a one month and a three months or option. But majority of them, <laughs> they don't, unfortunately. And everybody in this room should be very careful buying a three months or a deal at an extra squared. <laughs> we can't work it out why other banks are doing this and why, why it would possibly be a good idea for a bank to do it. Yeah, hence, I, I mean, at the same time, there are uh, banks in the market, I mean, it, that do offer a one month and a three months aura as well. But if you want to go in, for example, Jem has mentioned into a three months aura, then you probably want to find a bank or look out for a bank that offers you additional flexibilities on the mortgage, right? Um, so what are some of the flexibilities they do offer you? Number one, a conversion within the lock-in period, meaning to say at any point of time that you desire, currently you're on a floating interest rate, at any point of time you desire, you can move into a fixed interest rate. Right. There are banks that offer you that flexibility. Wait until you're out of the lock-in period before you do that. That's number one. Number two, some banks would allow you the flexibility to make a partial prepayment on the property as well right? within the lock-in period. So that's another uh, option. Number three, if you're looking to really sell the property, I mean, there is a waiver of a penalty due to sale. And the last one, which I've spoken um, in the presentation, is really if you have funds that you're not deploying or if you're waiting for the right time to go into the market, then you can use these funds that you have to basically offset the interest on the mortgage itself. So if you're really looking out for variable interest rates, especially in the short term when we know that interest rates are going up, then you, it's advisable to have them coupled with all these features. Because if you're just going in without any, uh, you know, some security, or maybe, maybe even a shorter lock-in would be good as well. You know, like a one-year lock-in period, it also helps you um, hedge against the risk because as compared to a two-year lock-in period, not so ideal. But yeah, you've got to couple that decision of going into a Sora packed rate um, with all these features just in case things go north. I mean, interest rates go north further. Yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, we, we, the consumers actually don't have a choice. They do. <laughs> there are banks. Uh, a fixed rate, a fixed rate. But uh, okay. yeah, right. yeah, that's right. But very limited choices. Um, and especially, you know, sometimes the banks that do offer a one month Sora have ridiculous spreads. So <laughs> then customers think again, ah, you know. Really? So yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Fun. Maybe just one more question, if I may, for the Endowers guys. Uh, I think, I, uh, as, as I understand it, you guys don't sell ETF funds yet. Why is that? We, we don't sell, um, list, we don't, you can't trade in listed securities on our platform. So you can buy index mutual funds, but not ETFs at the moment. And that, the reason for that- Is that gonna change ever? Um, it's possible. Actually, one of the reasons why is because we felt like there weren't a lot of good liquid ETFs on the Singapore market, right? And, and on CPF, we wanted to offer globally diversified portfolios, and that's not possible with ETFs. So we actually find um, index mutual funds or other mutual funds that are very, very low cost, that give you broad market exposure um, rather than use ETFs. I mean, we're, we're product agnostic, right? We want to find the best way to express our views. It doesn't really matter to us what the product is exactly. Um, and, and for us, it was really mutual funds to start with. Makes sense for Singapore, yeah. Beyond Singapore, I guess one day you'll, you'll, you'll have them. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. I mean, I, we don't have to keep you here if uh, you don't have any other questions. But I guess maybe just for the speakers, do you have any last comments or any thoughts around what we've discussed tonight? Oh. Yes, I shall each of you talk for like one minute and then we'll pass it and then we'll finish up. I'm going to start with this side. Yeah. <laughs>
So I think uh, I think in terms of the property market, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, you know pending you know questions of whether recession and things like that. I think uh, as a property guy, um, we really look at uh, you know the mid to long term. Uh, even if with or without, uh, we're always going for the mid to long term. So I think property is still a, a healthy product you know, to hedge. So I think this is something that you know, I would like to give more confidence uh, for those who are actually looking out to buy properties. Yes, interest rate might be high or higher, you know, but I think uh, there's always a time that it moderates. So ultimately, you know, we are looking at the bigger picture you know, on long term uh, in terms of an asset and the investment. right? So. Uh, Hopefully, you know you guys can look at property not just as a home, but probably as an investment. So there's always a two ways you can look at it. Yep. So uh, thank you. Great point. A- actually, I think like the the guys over here have so much in their heads. You you just need to ask the right questions to like, unlock. Then they will speak nonstop. Uh, but <laughs> but I think I think to Alex's point, yes, I think property is also another investment uh, uh, class that you can consider. And and I think the market itself. Um, especially Asians, right? Uh, if, if you if you don't do a lot of investments, I think that's the first thing that you attend to. Especially if you, you know, you first graduate. Oh, property market, property market. And if you're holding the property for a longer horizon, like what Alex mentioned, then generally prices still go up, right? Generally prices still go up. In fact, even now, uh, just now when we were talking about uh, Alex was talking about uh, property purchases where eighty or eighty five percent are buying for own stay. Actually, we still do. I mean, our clients still uh, do purchases for investments. Right. If you're a couple, you've you've uh, owned the property together. A very common thing would be a decoupling of the property, where the husband and wife, you know, they buy each other's shares over and buy another property. And what happens is that you can't even buy a property that's already currently rented out, right? You you buy with existing tenancy, and with the existing tenancy is recently renewed, as what Alex mentioned in the slides, your rental would be quite nice. So that also helps you offset a bit of the, the mortgage cost with, with rising mortgage interest rates as well. And an uh, uh, interesting thing, uh, if you don't already know about that, is that whenever you buy a property, if the existing property comes with tenancy, for example, there is a possibility that you can go to the bank and use that tenancy, the, the income that you're going to get, the future income that you're going to get, and that helps you boost your own eligibility as well, if you don't already know. So there are s- many ways uh, uh, to skin a cat, and especially go- to go into the, prop- the, the property market. Uh, but yeah, interest rates, it is, it is where it is at this point of time. Uh, make the decisions properly. Do your cash flows, most importantly. If 4.25% after working out the cash flow equates to X amount of dollars, and you're okay with that amount, then you know just hedge in the, in the short term. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, in today's inflationary environment, staying in cash is really not free. So you have to like think very carefully about how you want to allocate your cash because inflation is really eating into every dollar that you're holding at the bank and not using for um, whether it's investing in um, funds, investing in the market, or investing in property. Um, I guess the other thing that I want to emphasize is that, you know, think about property purchases, whether it's for your own stay or investment, in the context of your overall sort of financial picture, think about it in a more holistic way, kind of what your goals are, what your assets are, what your liabilities are. I mean, property is a great investment. It's done you know, very well for many Singaporeans of the last like decade, two decades. Um, but it's also because you tend to hold your property for a long period of time. You don't trade in and out of it, right? You're really, it's really time in the markets. And so you can apply that same context to your investment portfolios as well when you think about that. Thank you. All right, thanks so much everyone for uh, I think participating this evening. Um, if you guys have any questions this evening as shared, um, we will have our advisors from the different uh, companies downstairs. So please feel free to ask questions. And um, as mentioned also, please eat generously. Um, thank you again for your time. We will we have recorded this session. Um, it will be available um, on our platform. And I imagine the other platforms also um, in the next few days. If your friends were unable to make it tonight, please feel free to share um, the session with them also. But thank you again for your time and have a pleasant evening, everyone. Thank you.